You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. My name is Greg Jackson. I'm a PhD holding historian, a professor, and the creator of History That Doesn't Suck, a podcast that makes legit, seriously researched American history come to life through entertaining stories. Join me for a chronological telling of the United States story, from the revolution to fractious civil war, tenacious inventors, brave reformers, and more. With more than 100 episodes, you can already binge listen your way from 1776 to the early 20th century. Listen to History That Doesn't Suck on Spotify. special vexillology episode of our Civil War podcast. I'm Rich. And I'm Tracy. Hello, y'all. Welcome to the podcast. We know we said we weren't going to do a new episode this week, but we just wanted to add this show on Confederate flags as a short postscript to our discussion of the First Battle of Manassas. We decided we could justify sneaking in an extra episode at this point because the story goes that on Sunday, July 21st, 1861, during the battle there along Bull Run, just as victory seemed certain, Confederate General P.G.T. Beauregard saw a large force of troops advancing toward his flank. Beauregard later explained, quote, At their head waved a flag which I could not distinguish. Even by a strong glass, I was unable to determine whether it was the United States flag or the Confederate flag, end quote. Beauregard at first thought the unknown force was a column of enemy soldiers, and he admitted to a feeling of shock as he imagined the fresh Union troops turning the tide of the battle. He recalled, quote, I came reluctantly to the conclusion that after all our efforts, we should at last be compelled to yield to the enemy the hard-fought and bloody field, end quote. Beauregard even told a nearby officer to go back to Joseph E. Johnston and inform the senior Confederate commander that Johnston would shortly need to cover a retreat. But before the officer departed, Beauregard told him to wait a moment, to wait for confirmation that the mystery column was indeed the Yankees. And then, as Beauregard explained, quote, I took the glass and again examined the flag. A sudden gust of wind shook out its folds, and I recognized the stars and bars of the Confederate banner. End quote. So the mysterious flag was actually the Confederacy's first national flag, in this instance being carried by the 7th Louisiana, one of the regiments and Colonel Jubal Early's brigade, which laid in the battle at Manassas, was marching up to the firing line to attack the Federal Army's right flank. The Confederacy's first national flag, the so-called Stars and Bars, resembled the United States flag in both color and design. And so during the Civil War's first big battle, Beauregard wasn't the only Southerner who had trouble identifying one of his own side's flags. Earlier in the day, another Confederate officer, David R. Jones, had observed a body of troops approaching his position, and he, too, thought it might be the enemy. In reality, it was the 7th Louisiana, but not knowing that, Jones was readying his men to fire when, fortunately, Jubal Early rode up and cleared up the confusion. Because of these close calls, Beauregard, after the Southern victory at First Manassas, decided that the Confederacy needed a new standard, one that didn't so closely resemble the United States flag. And this might be a good time to tell you that if you go to the podcast website, We've posted images of all of these Confederate flags that we'll be discussing in this episode. Uh, so even if you want to head over there right now, you can go to www.civilwarpodcast.blogspot.com and you can check those out and see what these flags look like. So you can then have a picture in your mind's eye as we talk about them. So that's civilwarpodcast.blogspot.com. And here, we'll provide a short musical interlude while you pop over to the website.
course, it was no accident that the Stars and Bars, the Confederacy's first national flag, so closely resembled the United States flag, the Stars and Stripes. As y'all know already, representatives from the first seven states to secede from the Union met in Montgomery, Alabama in February 1861, and they formed the Confederate States of America. One of the first things they did was to create the Committee on Flag and Seal, and one of the committee's tasks, as you might guess, was to come up with a national flag for the new Southern slaveholding republic. It turned out there was a strong feeling amongst some of the committee members as well as an earnest desire amongst some of the Southern public, that the new standard ought to be strongly similar in both color and design to the flag of the United States. It seems that in the first months of the war, many Southerners, while they were all too ready to declare their absolute separation from the Union, well, they still felt an emotional pull toward the old symbols of the nation to which they had so recently belonged. After all, six U.S. presidents, as well as the composer of the Star-Spangled Banner, had been Southerners. But, at the start of the Civil War, there was also a strongly opinionated minority who wanted the new Confederacy's flag to be something entirely different, to mark a new beginning for Southerners. The leader of this faction was the chairman of the Committee on Flag and Seal, a South Carolinian named William Porcher Miles. Miles' hatred for the Stars and Stripes, which he said was the, quote, emblem of a hostile and tyrannical government, end quote, led him to propose a completely different standard of his own creation. Miles' design was apparently based on a South Carolina secession flag that he had then modified using the St. Andrew's Cross as inspiration. But hundreds of designs for the Confederacy's new flag were examined by the Committee on Flag and Seal, and it eventually narrowed its choices to four. Not surprisingly, since he was chairman of the committee, one of the four finalists was Miles Creation. But when the four designs were presented to the Provisional Confederate Congress for a final decision, the delegates actually voted for the design that became known as the Stars and Bars, which was the creation of Nicola Marshall a German fellow living in Alabama. The Confederate Congress wanted to have their new country's own flag up and flying by March 4th, the date of Abraham Lincoln's inauguration as President of the United States. And with its selection of the stars and bars, the Confederate Congress met that unofficial deadline. And so on March 4th, 1861, Letitia Tyler, the granddaughter of former President John Tyler, raised the Confederate States of America's first national flag at the Capitol in Montgomery. And that was pretty much the high point for the Stars and Bars. The Committee on Flag and Seal, again not surprisingly, since Miles was its chairman, had pointed out the folly of choosing any flag that was similar to the U.S. flag. The committee said, quote, It is superfluous to dwell on the practical difficulties which would flow from the fact that two distinct and probably hostile governments, both employing the same or very similar flags, it would lead to endless confusion and mistakes, end quote. As one author points out, the Stars and Bars honeymoon with the Southerners lasted just four months before the committee's prediction of confusion and mistakes became reality. As we've already mentioned, the confusion over trying to identify friend from foe at the First Battle of Manassas led Confederate General P.G.T. Beauregard to voice his belief that the Confederacy needed to lay aside the stars and bars and adopt a new, entirely different national flag. Beauregard addressed his concerns to Miles, who was still committee chairman, but who had also served as an aide to Beauregard at Charleston during the crisis over possession of Fort Sumter. In August, a month after the battle at Manassas, Miles told Beauregard that support in the Confederate Congress for a new flag was lukewarm at best. In fact, the Committee on Flag and Seal had again rejected Miles' St. Andrew's Cross design. Not to be deterred, Beauregard changed strategy, now proposing that what the Confederate military needed was a new and distinct battle flag. In a letter to his superior, Joseph E. Johnston, Beauregard said, quote, I wrote to Miles that we should have two flags, a peace or parade flag, and a war flag to be used only on the field of battle. How would it be for us to address the War Department on the subject, 
for a supply of regimental or batch flags made of red with two blue bars crossing each other diagonally on which shall be introduced the stars, the edge of the flag to be trimmed all around with white, yellow, or gold fringe. We would then, on the field of battle, know our friends from our enemies. End quote. Well, this battle flag was, of course, pretty much the exact design that Miles had come up with and that had been shot down twice at the Confederate Congress. But Joe Johnston agreed to Beauregard's proposal for a battle flag, only making the suggestion that the battle flag be perfectly square and thus better proportioned. And so the Army Quartermaster arranged for 120 silk flags to be made by 75 women in four Richmond churches. At a ceremonial presentation at Centerville, Virginia, in late November 1861, the new battle flags were received by the units of what was then the Confederate's Army of the Potomac, but is better known later on as the Army of Northern Virginia. A reporter for the Richmond Daily Dispatch newspaper witnessed the ceremony and wrote, quote, The flag itself is a beautiful banner, which I am sure, before this campaign is over, will be consecrated forever in the affections of the people of the Confederate States. End quote. Shortly after that, Beauregard was sent out to the Western Theater, and later on, Joe Johnston assumed command of the Army of Tennessee. And so, thanks to its well-traveled patrons, the St. Andrew's Cross Confederate battle flag was taken up by other Southern armies. Hey, y'all. Spooky season is here. And if you're looking for a show to whet your appetite for a little haunted history, then I'd like to invite you to check out Southern Gothic, a chart-topping history podcast that explores some of the most infamous legends, folklore, ghost stories, and hauntings of the American South. We've covered all sorts of stuff from the Bell Witch of Tennessee to the disappearance of the Confederate submarine, the H.L. Hunley, not to mention our deep dives into the local lore of some of America's oldest and most haunted cities like New Orleans, Charleston, and St. Augustine. So, if you're ready for a little good old-fashioned Halloween storytelling with a commitment to quality historical research, then be sure to check out Southern Gothic today. It's available now on all your favorite podcast apps. What's something you learned in history class that you feel wasn't the whole truth? Better yet, What's something you didn't learn at all that was omitted completely? That's what I like to call redacted history. I believe that all history, no matter how good or bad, needs to be told. There are wars, massacres, battles, and entire historical events that are just not in our school's history books. Have you ever heard of Mary Bowser? I didn't think so. My name is Andre White, the host of the Redacted History Podcast, the place where history's forgotten events, Heroes and villains get their story told one episode at a time. So come huddle around the campfire with me and get ready to hear the stories that you were robbed of and get comfortable. We're going to be here a while. The Redacted History Podcast. Real history never dies. Stream the Redacted History Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Today, that battle flag is the Confederate flag most widely seen in America, and in most people's minds is the flag of the Confederacy, and for 150 years has been the symbol of the rebel cause. But the Southern Cross, as it's sometimes known, was actually never an official flag of the Confederate government, and it never flew over public buildings. However, it was incorporated into the Confederacy's second and third national flags. Thanks to Beauregard's concerns and to the lobbying of others, by the late summer of 1861, many Southerners realized that the first flag, the Stars and Bars, was impractical as a battle flag and uninspiring as a national standard. For example, in September 1861, the Richmond Inquirer newspaper scratched out the Stars and Bars from an illustration of the Confederate Capitol building. By November, other Southern newspapers were running stories showing the growing public desire for a new, distinctive national flag. 
A resolution was approved by the Confederate Congress authorizing the Committee on Flag and Seal to look into the matter of a new flag, but delays and red tape meant that the effort plotted along for about a year and a half before the Stars and Bars reign as national flag ended in April 1863. On May 1, 1863, the Confederacy adopted a new national standard, the so-called Stainless Banner, which featured the square St. Andrew's Cross battle flag as the Union on an all-white field. Public reaction to the new flag was favorable. The Richmond Daily Dispatch reported that, quote, The new flag, which was displayed from the Capitol on Thursday, it is gratifying to say, gives universal satisfaction. Almost any sort of a flag to take the place of the detested parody of the Stars and Stripes, for so long the lawful emblem of the Confederacy, would have been hailed with pleasure. In this is preserved that immortal banner, the battle flag, which has been consecrated on so many battlefields. End quote. The first official use of the stainless banner was to cover the coffin of Stonewall Jackson following his death after he was wounded by friendly fire at the Battle of Chancellorsville. But the design of the Confederacy's second national flag was also proved to be a mistake. While it was distinctive and could be easily identified while flying at a distance, it also, because of its white field, could be misinterpreted as a flag of truce when there was no breeze and it was hanging limply. This mistake was eventually corrected on March 4, 1865, when a vertical red bar was added to the fly edge of the flag. But the reign of the Confederacy's third national flag was brief. By the time it was adopted, the Confederacy had only one month to live. That means it's time for this episode's book recommendation. And our recommendation this time is the New York Times Disunion, Modern Historians Revisit and Reconsider the Civil War from Lincoln's Election to the Emancipation Proclamation. Many of you might already be familiar with the New York Times blog about the Civil War, which roughly follows the chronology of the war and has already published hundreds of original articles by many scholars, journalists, historians, and Civil War buffs. Well, this book gathers together more than a hundred of those essays, covering events and topics beginning with Lincoln's capture of the presidency and going up through the Emancipation Proclamation. And one of the articles in this volume is titled The Southern Cross, and it's a short look at the history behind the adoption of the Confederate battle flag. But really, all of the essays in this book are worth a read, so we encourage you to check out the New York Times Disunion, and it's edited by Ted Widmer. As always, you can find all our book recommendations, as well as images of all the flags we discussed in this episode, if you go to the podcast website, which is www.civilwarpodcast.blogspot.com. And then we wanted to be sure to thank Winans A. from Georgia, who went to the website and made a donation to the podcast this past week, and he also left us a lovely note. And then one final thing. One day this past week, I went back and listened to all eight episodes on First Manassas, uh, pretty much straight through, and I noticed Tracy made a mistake that we need to correct. What? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, well, there was one big mistake, or just one that I caught, but in episodes 53 and 54, we refer to Stonewall Jackson as still being a colonel, when in fact, uh, in June 1861, a month before the Battle of Manassas, he had been promoted to Brigadier General. And then, uh, also, an error of omission, I guess, in that we didn't say that Colonel Francis Bartow, who was another of Johnston's brigade commanders from the Shenandoah Valley Force, uh, but Bartow was actually killed during the Battle at Manassas uh, during the fighting around Henry Hill, and we failed to mention that. And so we just wanted to bring those things to your attention. And if you guys ever catch any glaring mistakes that we make, uh, please contact us and tell us about them. And you can contact us by email or message us on Facebook or Twitter, or you can always leave a comment on the website. All right, I think that's it for this show. Uh, so thanks for listening to this episode of The Civil War, 1861-1865, to 1865, a history podcast. We hope you'll join us again next time 
when we will talk about Civil War medicine. But until then, take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.